Elon Musk donated $5.7 billion worth of Tesla shares to charity. The gift is disclosed in filing that doesn't identify a recipient. You know, at a certain point, really what you're doing is capital allocation. So you're not, it's not money for personal expenditure. It's, it's it, what you're doing is, is capital allocation. And it does not make sense to take uh, the, the job of capital allocation away from people who have demonstrated great skill in capital allocation and give it to, uh, you know, an entity that has demonstrated very poor skill in, in capital allocation, which is the government. I feel much more comfortable with our ability as a private foundation to allocate those funds than I do giving them to the government. Donor advised funds are this kudzu that's eating up the world of charitable giving. We're losing the charitable giving of some of the people who are most capable of giving large gifts because it's going into these entities and it's staying there. Each day, we're treated with multiple stories of billionaires donating millions to charities, often as an act of generosity. Whether we like the donor's giving strategy or not, we are encouraged to think of these private actions as choices beneficial to the wider public, although most of the time, that's not really the case. Instead, we should be thinking as, these are our private tax dollars at work. The public has a legitimate and appropriate public interest in the seemingly private charitable donations of the ultra-rich. And as the wealth inequality grows and philanthropy becomes more top-heavy, with growing percent of the charitable giving pie coming from the top 1%, we should pay additional attention. Are you aware that we as taxpayers actually subsidize these donations in the form of lost tax revenue? And the wealthier the donor, the bigger the tax subsidy we provide. For every $1 a billionaire gives to charity, the rest of us chip in as much as 74% in lost tax revenue, which we will explain to you in this video. But before we do that, welcome to Financial Interest, where you will learn everything you need to know about money and investing. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Relative to nearly every other aspect of the federal income tax, the workings of the deduction have changed little since the creation in 1917. Both major political parties at the time have called to reform the tax deduction structure, which disproportionately grants high income taxpayers the eligibility and the highest subsidy rates. Yet the structure is no accident. High income households have always been the main beneficiaries of the charitable contribution deduction. It is a policy that is essentially and not accidentally elitist. The contribution deduction was created to preserve the voluntary giving by rich industrialists who had made their fortunes by monopolizing various sectors. Philanthropic activities in the US did not begin as a response to tax policy. Indeed, the great foundations of Carnegie and Rockefeller predate to the 16th Amendment. Lawmakers saw such philanthropists as a source of social capital that should be protected from high tax rates. The government was ready to take any measures to avoid herself of having to pay for the programs the ultra-rich had previously funded voluntarily. In 1913, the same year Rockefeller chartered his foundation, the Congress initiated the first modern income tax. In the first year of the income tax, fewer than 1% of households were subject to it, and it had rates no higher than 15%. However, in 1917, the top rate was absurdly raised to 67% to pay for the First World War. The change was made not to discourage the elite's continued giving in light of a larger tax bill. After the Second World War, wealthy high-income industrialists discovered that under steep post-war tax rates, they were better off by giving away their wealth than consuming it directly. This incentive precipitated a surge in charitable giving and foundation establishment that transformed the civil society of the United States and eventually led to a new regulation of the nonprofit sector. The reason for this giving surge is relatively simple. Gifts of corporate stock are deductible at fair market value of the share price at the time of the donation. And because the shares are not sold by the donor, the donor avoids paying any capital gains tax, in addition to deducting the full value of the shares from their taxable income. This way, donation of stocks avoids two types of taxes. It is mathematically possible for such donations to leave the donor with more money in hand 
than it would have resulted if he or she had sold the stock and paid the taxes. When the US Congress raised the income tax rate in the mid-20th century, it has exactly created this situation. The richest American families avoided more in taxation by giving their fortunes to foundations than they would have received in proceeds for selling their shares of stock. And as a result, foundations flourished. The ultra-wealthy simply don't distribute money the same way as we do. One of the ways they abuse the charity tax system is through the use of private foundations and donor-advised funds, in short, DAFs. The latter financial vehicle is by far the most outrageous of the two. If you want to save millions on your taxes, there are three main reasons why DAFs stand out. First of all, there are no minimum spending requirements. Unlike private foundations, which are required to give out at least 5% of their assets per year, DAFs don't have any distribution requirements. You can park your billions in a DAF and leave it untouched for decades, free from the taxman and free from being distributed throughout society. Secondly, the tax benefits are like no other. It allows wealthy people to immediately reap enormous income tax reductions for appreciated assets, even though the money doesn't need to be spent right away. Essentially, they use DAFs to avoid paying any capital gains tax by donating the shares instead of cash. Those donations then become deductible against any income tax owed from elsewhere. And thirdly, you don't even have to disclose any details about your charitable act. DAFs are also not required to state where the donations are going or who holds what amounts. Is your child approaching college age and you're worried about their chances of getting accepted? Why not donate millions to the top colleges in the country for a few years first? It's all tax-free at the end of the day. Let me show you a real-world example of how to save half a billion dollars on your tax bill with the convenience of donor-advised funds. DAFs are a fantastic way to store your wealth for a rainy day if you have billions to spare. It is why some people refer to them as a form of charitable checking account because they are certainly aren't meant to be for charity alone. If you're facing a gigantic tax bill in any particular year, just make an unaccountable giant donation to your very own DAF and get the bill down to zero as soon as possible. Kind of like how the literal embodiment of the tech bro Nicholas Woodman, the founder and CEO of GoPro did when his company went public in 2014. During the same year, his incredibly successful company earned him $3 billion in stock from its IPO. He suddenly had an overwhelmingly charitable feeling and donated $500 million to a death. And he said, we wake up every morning grateful for the opportunities life has given us. And we hope to return the favor as best as we can. People praise them for their extreme generosity, giving back a sixth of their hard-won earnings. Fast forward four years later after an investigation by the New York Times, and there was only one public record of a donation from the same DAF account an unspecified amount given to a fundraiser called the Bonnie Dune Art, Wine and Brew Festival. The $500 million he donated was almost surely used to massively decrease his tax bill that year to relatively nothing. A tax bill that would have been in hundreds of millions. The simplistic math of the long-term capital gains tax would put that number at somewhere around 15% of the $3 billion, which would make around $450 million. A $500 million deductible charitable donation, the same year of a $450 million potential tax bill. Surely that must have been a coincidence, and definitely not an extreme form of legalized tax evasion. From the list of the 50 largest donors in the US, the top 14 made their donations mainly through their own private foundations or donor advised funds. Donations to a person's own charitable intermediary should not be counted as a gift, since the money is still under their control and hasn't yet gone to an active charity. The Forbes magazine list of top donors takes this into account and only includes donations that flow to working charities and not foundations or DAFs. As a result of the wealthy giving preferences these days, the total amount sitting in a warehouse of charity dollars in private foundations and DAFs is now estimated to be over $1.1 trillion. This is part of a larger problem of the top-heavy philanthropy. 
Over the last few decades, donations from the low- and middle-income donors have steadily declined. And almost all growth in charitable giving has come from the ultra-wealthy donors. Wealthy donors love to give to the foundations and DAFs that they control. Roughly 28% of the charitable donations now go to such intermediaries. As mentioned in the beginning, for every dollar a billionaire donates, we as taxpayers chip in up to 74% of that dollar in lost tax revenue. And the wealthier the donor, the bigger the tax subsidy. Since these gifts not only reduce their income taxes, but also estate, gift and capital gains tax. These savings are possible for a gift of an appreciated asset, which the donor has a zero-cost basis. The charitable deduction will save the donor 37% of the value of the gift and an additional 20% of the value of the contributed asset if it's subject to any capital gains taxes and if the donor is subject to a state tax, another 17%, bringing the total tax benefits to a whopping 74%. The tax benefit can be even more if the asset can be marked as overvalued, a recurring issue for non-publicly traded assets. The Congress should modernize the rules governing charities to increase the flow of giving to working ones and to discourage the warehousing of billions in donor-controlled intermediaries. Some members have introduced legislation to do this with the Accelerate Charitable Efforts Act, but it didn't go far enough. Lawmakers should double the payout rate for private foundations to 10% and require DAFs to have a payout rate. They should increase the donation tax credit for low- and middle-income donors and they should establish a lifetime giving cap so the ultra-wealthy don't get to entirely opt out of paying taxes. Our society and our vibrant, independent, non-profit sector benefits from the generosity of individuals. But we should encourage charitable giving by people of all incomes and not just the wealthy. And we should be vigilant to ensure that philanthropy doesn't become another extension of the power and influence of the billionaire class. So next time you hear about a billionaire donating a large amount to a university or any other museum project, take pride, you paid for that too. If you made it this far, I hope you enjoyed the video. I would love to hear your feedback down in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on the notifications so you don't miss out on our next video. And give it a big thumbs up and I'll see you next week.